and I go, I've received no email at all. That really hurt. And I, the words that just come out make me head what? Uh, 127 in game. I cried a few tears when I told me. I, I still love it so much. Uh. Well, there are many iconic names in the world of darts, most of them the players, but there are a few who work in other areas of the sport that become household names in their own right. And one of them has joined myself and Glenn Durant for a chat today. Uh, Mr. Paul Hinks, thanks for joining us. We can have a nice chat of your uh, career and, and life and times, but uh, thanks so much for, for being here with us. My pleasure. We've got Glenn Durant as well with us. Uh, Glenn, this man here, he, he's an absolute legend, isn't he? He's an absolute legend. Like, just even though the older players, the younger players, and for me, it all boils down to his incredible professionalism and that unbelievable shout of 180. One and as a dark player, you know, th th there's a moment and w when you're on that stage and you hear it for the first time. You know, if, you, if you watch the first game I do, I look over to my family because it's that iconic. Well, let's start there, Paul. I know you've shared this story before, but just let, remind everyone, where did that 180 call come from? Um, I've always watched darts and I've watched the referees. And I always say that when you listen to referees, they always seem to impersonate another referee's call. I hold my hand up. I actually did that. I used to call like Tony Green. And then when I, when I went to the PDC, Tommy Cox uh, told me that... Um, you had to get your own call like so as people would recognise it by. And he asked me to put the word maximum into the um, 180. So for, for quite a while I was calling maximum 180. I'm not going to let you get away with that. How did it actually go? Maximum 180! But Sky said it was too long for television, so I would ask to drop it and go away and find my own 180, which is very hard. It's very hard. I don't care what anybody says. If somebody says, get your own 180, it's very hard to do it. Luckily enough, I, I, I was an Alice Cooper fan and they had a single out quite a lot of years ago called School's Out for Summer. And at the end of that single, it went, School's Out for Summer. And I thought, that's, I can actually change that into 180. And I, I devised that 180 call, which you now, well, you've heard for quite a lot of years now. And that's where it came from, the Alice Cooper song. School's out for summer. Yeah, that everybody knows and loves that, that 180 call. Glenn, I mean, you mentioned that there are players that come here to the Super Series. To have this man officiating their matches, to get that first 180 call from him, it must be something special. No, I think your line this afternoon in t today's session was, it's great to have the legend here, that's Paul Hinks. And he's a very humble man. He's a very, very nice guy, you know, easily to speak to and very, very well respected. One of those people you don't hear a bad word said about him. Let's go a little bit further back. What were you doing before getting involved into darts? How did that transition happen? Um, I work, well, I started working for the De Department of Health and Social Security, which is now the Department of Work and Pensions, uh, back in 1975. And I used to go down to me, when I was at school, I used to go down to the local um, youth club, as you can call it. And I was in a pub one day, and which we always, used to go in called Barnsley Oak and I was just sat there watching these three men throwing on a ball and they asked me if I'd get one make a forehand up and I said well I've never thrown a dart before in my life anyhow I got up and I really enjoyed it and I got right into it and they asked me to join their team and, and I told my dad who was secretary at local league and he said oh if you're not going to join them if you're going to join a club you're going to join a right club and he took me to where he played at the old Militel at South Kirby and I went there and progressed from there and I became captain, we won numerous league and cup doubles um, and that's basically where, my, where I started. So you were a decent player then? I used to play up to county standard, I never played for county but I used to play up to county standard. I won 23 Yorkshire titles and three national titles in my time. Doesn't sound bad, does it? No, it doesn't sound bad. And then you, did you kick on in the years of sort of the Dennis Hicklins of this world? Is that the, is that the era you were sort of playing or...? Yeah. Um, when I, when, I, when I started calling for Yorkshire, there were like, say, like Brian Langworth and uh, Brian Bird, or mm. uh, Tony Bowers, who were captain, uh, Ronnie Cochran, who was the These are names I know as well, but it's yeah. a very Yorkshire thing. Not, not that I'm a Yorkshireman, because yeah. I don't spend money. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they, they, Brian Langworth in particular was one of those ones where he could have been a great, couldn't he? He was one of those naturally brilliant players. Yeah. 
It's yeah. two against one, by the way, Glenn, so just, yeah. just be careful. Can I just say that Middlesbrough's actually in half the option? Cut, cut. <laughs> yeah, well, look, so how did you then transition from doing that to starting to make that, that step into refereeing? Um, I used to watch television at local, and uh, I can't remember it well, but somebody said one day, why don't you do that? Because, you know, what, what we're seeing here, you, you're just doing that at local pub. So I decided to do something about it. I contacted uh, Yorkshire County, and at the time they were doing what they call inner, inner county, which are north, south, east and west Yorkshire. So they took me along and I actually called the matches for north against south Yorkshire, against west and east and all that. And then I progressed from there to County B, and then I went on to do uh, County A matches. And I'm, I'm still doing Yorkshire County matches now when I, when I can, when I'm available, because I've always said it's my grassroots, it's where I started, and if they need hand out, then I will help them out. And then you end up refereeing on the biggest stages in the world in front of packed audiences. Mm. What was it like, say, the first time you went in front of a, a massive crowd in a big tournament? Were there any sort of nerves or anything from you? Because we talk about nervous players, but we never really think of the referees doing stuff like that for the first time. Yeah. Um, how I got taken on by the, the PDC, uh, they were looking for a fourth referee at the time to link up with Freddie Williams, Bruce Spanley and Russ Bray. And I'd gone to a, a county match and uh, a chap there who called for Yorkshire County, uh, Fred Cooper, who sadly passed away now, he said he'd, he was going for a trial at Reebok, they were looking at four referees and I, I just wished him the best of luck. Because uh, Rab Butler, who was also with Yorkshire, he'd been taken on by England. And um, Fred come back and none of the referees got asked to, to go back. And I did a lot of exhibition work with Dennis Priestley. Mm. And we were out in California at the time. And um, we went on to Vegas and Dennis said, do you fancy going for that fourth referee sort with PDC? Uh, because you're a good ass, if not better than anything that we've actually got. So I said, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have a go. And we had a word with Tommy Cox, who was tournament director, uh, and he said, yeah, well, listen to me in Blackpool. So when we came home, we'd not heard from Tommy, and we were rung him up because we were at a barbecue and, uh, one day, and Tommy said, yeah, I've not forgot, well, listen to me in Blackpool. So we said, well, what pub do you want to, to come along to, to listen to him like? And he said, pub? He said, I'll go straight on live television at the World Match Play. Wow. And Coming back to your question, live audiences, I went on stage at uh, the World Match Play for my like, so we call it a trial, uh, again, and it was Dennis Smith against Steve Brown from America. I can remember Steve Brown coming on stage, shaking me hand, leaning over and whispering in my ear, you don't know what you've let yourself in for. And he didn't, because 11 legs later, he was sat at side at stage, he'd got beat 10-1. Wow. So the crowd, understandably, all nervous. Um, and I was quite, quite nervous for quite a while, but then you just, just clicked in and it didn't bother me after that. It still doesn't bother me to this day. Right. Any, any fantastic memories, any sort of highlights that you look back at and think, that's a moment I'll always remember on stage? Um, well, that famous 127, as you know, all of that. <laughs> that was my next question, I thought. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. They beat you to it. Quite a lot of people come up and say, um, when you got that score wrong, I said, what score? They said, that 127. I always say, well, I didn't get it wrong, I just put it all the way around. Um, the expression on Michael Van Gerwen and Phil Taylor's face, because uh, I think it was the, the last leg before they actually went off for a break, and uh, I just, it, it just took me, it surprised me, and I, the words that just come out of my head were uh, 127 in game. That confused uh, everybody, not just Phil yeah. and Michael, but the people who many play the music on, on TV didn't play it, the lights yeah. weren't flashing, everyone was just yeah. looking around, but it did make a moment and kind of something that you've really become known for, so yeah. it sounds like you've kind of embraced it. Yeah. yeah, look, yeah. I've got to talk about Phil Taylor as well, I, I mean he's someone who, when, when you get confirmation from him that he likes you refereeing, obviously Bruce Spendley was another one where you almost, when Phil Taylor got on the stage, you knew Bruce was going to be there. Yeah. And it got to a stage when Phil was there, it was you as well. Was that a big tick as well, or...? Yeah, I had a lot of respect for Phil. Yeah. The only, the only thing that beats me up with Matt Phil is, I never actually called the nine darts for Phil. So. Really? Yeah. I'm probably the only referee that was there at the time, are you, Freddie, Bruce, Russ, that never called her uh, 
nine data for Phil Taylor. And we're actually talking to you on the day mm -hmm. when you've called your 24th nine data that happened That's here true, in the, yeah. the Moda Super Series. Out yeah. of those nine dart finishers, is there any that you really remember? More? Can you even remember all of them? I mean, don't try, but is it one that stands out? There's quite a few, actually. Uh, the World Grand Prix, where James Wade and Robert Thornton played one another oh. and both hit a nine data in the same match. That stands out. John Parts won an only televised nine data at Blackpool, Will Matt's way. Uh, Gary Anderson's in semi final at the World, World Championship Champions yeah. against Jelly Clarsen. Uh, and there's two that, that stick in my mind because I love this player. I think he was fantastic. I loved his walk on song. He was great when he was on stage, really. Well, he was such a fantastic person. He did a nine data against Ian White in World Championships and a nine data against Michael Van Gaven in a European event, and that was uh, the, the late Kyle Anderson. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, good friend of yours as well, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, that sort of went, went through me a little bit when you said his name there. But yeah. something that you touched on there, you said, I was with Dennis Priestley in California, as if, you know, that's what you often say. <laughs> Can I yeah. ask you, you you've, you've been and seen the world now. Rather than asking the straight forward, what was your favourite kit? What was your favourite venue, your best place you ever visited out of the UK? Favourite place out of the UK? Yeah. Ooh. You know, obviously you've travelled the world with it, but I just get this sense with your personality, you just brushed it aside, yeah. I was in California with Priestley. I enjoyed uh, Dubai when I did the final I was with gonna be uh, Gary Anderson and Michael Van Gerwen, because it, it went all the 21 legs. Gary won 11 10, and both players averaged over, over 100. 110, actually, yeah. And that was played outdoors, wasn't it? And it played outdoors on a, on a tennis court, and it was about 40 odd degrees heat. I yeah. couldn't get a legendary darts referee without asking him to spill the beans a little bit. Are there any players, or you don't have to name them, but have there been any, any instances on stage when you know a player is up to no good, especially if it's Glenn Durant? Um, no, not really. I'll tell you no, what I did. No. When I walked on once and I said to you, I'm glad you're a referee. And I, never, <laughs> yeah. I never lose when you ref. Yeah, that, I, think I that got beat 3 0. Wolverhampton. Wolverhampton. Yeah. If they wasn't, that means that they, they didn't do it when you're refing because they had that amount of respect yeah. and the authority for you. Um, yeah. I did want to talk about the way things sort of ended at the PDC as well. Your last match, World Championship final, Gary Anderson and Gerwin Price, is that right? That was the. Um, World final, I did it all three weeks at that one, and then I'd, yeah, Gilwin Price beat Gary. But my last two days at the, the, with the PDC were at the UK Open. Oh. And that's, I just wanted to ask you about that match with Price and Anderson, actually, because it's a sort of blaze of glory to go out in great final. You also had a bit of history because you refereed that infamous match at Wolverhampton as well. That's right, yeah. yeah. So the pair of them, I mean, that would have been a big final to, to ref, knowing the history between those two players to make sure that they yeah. kind of did. Could yeah, you believe what was going calm. on, Paul? Or were you on your focus of doing your job? Or was it on, you know, you couldn't miss what was going on? Well, you didn't focus on what you're doing your job, but you couldn't miss what was actually going on between them. Right? But, uh, no, you, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of that, a lot of things that's happened on stage as well. You must look back very fondly. And I, I look I look at uh, that incident and people, I mean, people go on about Gary Price when he used to, when he to 180. People, people have cheered the 180s when yeah. there's not many Gary Price was that. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and for yeah. years as well, not just the new couple of players, is it? You had Eric Bristow back in the day yeah. doing all sorts of things. There was much more going on in the yeah. olden days, maybe. Yeah. Um, but on that, like, when it did sort of come to an end with the PDC, how did that, how did that come about? Um, well, it was during COVID and uh, as an official, what, what you usually get is they, set, they also send you a, an email out with you like a 12 month rotor on uh, what, what, you, uh, work rotor, what, what you're doing for the year. And uh, it got to July and I've not heard from anybody or seen anybody. And I went to my, my good friend Bruce Spenley's funeral up in the up in the northeast, and um, I, I bumped into me my good friend Gary Wood, and he said, "What are you doing next?" Because nobody else knows what anybody else is doing. And uh, I said, "Well, I don't know because I've not seen or spoken to anybody since the the UK Open." So we both went our own separate ways, and then that went July. In September, I got an email from the tournament director. Saying he'd been speaking to Gary and uh, I'd said like that I'd not seen or heard from anybody since the UK Open. 
And he says, but I did send you an email just after the UK open, explaining that basically I didn't know what happened due to COVID, but um, a couple of changes, one of which they were, they were dropping me down to number five and moving you where up to work alongside Russ Bray, George Noble and Kurt Bevins. So I checked my email, junk and spam, and I got received no email at all. And so I just messaged back saying, uh, well, this is first I've heard of it, so if that's what your plans are, then there's nothing else I can do about it. Um, and that basically, I've not heard from anybody at all since that day. But you never in, in the the PDC game after that? No, never. Do you think you deserved better than that after all those years of service? Well, I've got to be honest, I worked for 17 years with PDC and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed all the 17 years. I never, I never let them down. Um, and just for it to happen like that, I, I, I think that if, if they'd have sent an email and they know that was going to happen, then why didn't they send something at what, UK Open? Um, but to not, like, best to get a thank you, I suppose, um, that really hurt. Yeah. You know, in here, like, it, but it's history now and I've moved on, so. Yeah, I can imagine it, it, it mm. would have hurt, it would have stuck in the throat a little bit. Mm. But as you say, you have moved on, gone on to other things. Let's just talk about those yeah. at the moment, because it has opened the door for you to do things like the Moda Super Series, yeah. the World Series as well, which I know is something that you're really proud of doing. Yeah, I love doing that. Um, not long after after I got that email, I did get a, a phone call from, from Jason uh, asking me, like, he said, I'm setting this World Seniors up. I'd like you to come along as me number one referee, I, I, would you like to do that? And I said, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to. So I, I started doing the World Seniors and I've, I've done all the tournaments up to now that they've put on, on TV. And like you said, the Molder Super Series, George Noble got in touch with me about that. And I've been doing this, ooh, it's maybe third year now. Yeah, different as well, isn't it, this? Because you're doing a lot of matches in quite, over quite a long period of time. Well, people have asked me, um, what would you say is the hardest refereeing that you, you have to do in all times you've been going? And I've got, I've got to be honest, this is the hardest because you have 104 matches to do in a week and to actually be going on stage and off and on and off. I believe that this is the hardest tournament that you can do. Yeah. Glenn uh, found that when he was on that stage as well. Yeah. That's not very nice to see. He's gone seven and a half minutes without <laughs> bullying me there. I've got to ask the question though. When I think of you at the seniors, you started with a shirt and tie on there. So if what's the best? Is it these t-shirts that they're wearing in the PDC or the Murray Super Series? Or do you like in the blistering heat of Yeovil wearing a suit, yeah. a shirt and tie? I believe, and I, I, I always stand by it, that I think it looks more professional if you've got a referee standing up there that's got a shirt tie and a suit on, because I think that mother comes over as more professional. Old school secrets. Yeah. Good answer. Well, look, usually we'd wrap up a, an interview like this by asking what the future holds, and I suppose we can do the same with you. Um, are there any plans to, to wind down, or are you, are you still loving it so much that you want to do as much refereeing as possible? I, I still love it so much. Uh, this year, I mean, the year this year up to now, I've got uh, the World, uh, World Seniors, Molder Super Series, I've got umpteen exhibitions. I now actually do the Royal Mail National Finals. Uh, I was contacted uh, by them after the great John Gwynn passed away, because uh, he used to go along and call their finals and chair it. And uh, they contacted me and they wanted me to actually do what John did. I said, well, I can't tell jokes. I'm not a comedian like John was. They said, no, you don't need to do that. We just want you to call finals and like do presentation and get a professional player on to do presentation. And uh, so I, I took that on board. And then what brought a tear, well, not a tear to me, I, I, I cried a few tears when they told me, but Alan Grafton, who was the chairman of the Royal Mail, went to see John just before he, he, he passed away. And Gwynny as, as he was, he turned around and said, what are we going to do about this Royal Mail then, Alan? And Alan says, no, what, what do you think? He says, well, I think you ought to take Paul Inks on. And no, better endorsement that, than that, man. Sure, he showed me when he told me, and, uh, and now I'm doing Royal Mail.
the absolutely fitting tribute. Um, final word to you, Glenn, because I think it is right that we do pay tribute to everything that Paul has achieved in his career. How important are people like Paul for this game? I hope the interviews come across of how humble he is. Like I said, he could have easily spoken about I was involved in this and, and, and started talking, I've been here. And I just get the sense from him, yeah, I was just doing my job, Glenn, you know, whether it was Dubai or whether it was in the Barnsley Workham and Social Club, I just got the sense from that interview speaking to him, it wasn't really about him. I'm there, I'm doing a professional job and I've never let anyone down and he never will. He's a top, top man. Yeah, absolute pleasure to have you here at the Moda Super Series. Thanks for speaking to us. Um, that's uh, the final word from me and from Glenn. But, Paul, I think the way to finish it is to give you the final number. Take it away. What are we going to do?